similar things or something even completely different. The U.S. Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit in San Francisco heard oral arguments on the case January 17th. Both sides were given 30 minutes. And we will call the last case on the oral argument calendar for today, which is designated Bank of America et al. versus the City of Santa Monica et al. California Federal Bank, Plaintiff Intervenor Appley. May it please the court. Good morning. My name is Owen Mardigan, representing the San Francisco defendants. Arguing with me today is Adam Radinsky, representing the Santa Monica defendants. We will divide our time and reserve four minutes for rebuttal. The standard applicable in this implied conflict preemption case is whether the city's ordinances stand as an obstacle to the accomplishment of congressional purposes and objectives. This court does not imply preemption where Congress did not intend it. In this case, there is at least 25 years of consistent, clear expressions of congressional intent that state and local governments carry the authority to regulate in the area of national bank fees, in the area of ATM, ATM transactions. Tell us what these ordinances are. What are yes. we talking about? I think the clearest expression of congressional intent is in 1994. No, no, I'm telling you, tell us that what the ordinances are that are the subject of this litigation. City's ordinances. Right. The city's ordinances um, do basically the same thing. They ban uh, a second charge that the banks uh, impose in an ATM transaction where the customer is not doing a transaction with the bank that owns the ATM but with another institution. Uh, customers can use an ATM, obviously, for a number of services. The ordinances do not affect a transaction where the customer is depositing money or withdrawing money from the bank that owns the transaction, uh, that owns the ATM machine. But I, I understand that the banks were providing a generalized service to anybody who belonged, who was a depositor with any bank. You come to our ATM, you put in your card, you put in your numbers, you can take money out. And if, you, if you're a depositor in our bank, we don't charge you anything. If you're a depositor not at our bank, but this money is coming from some other bank, ultimately we're going to charge you a dollar fifty. It's an essence. It's in essence a conduit function. It's an intermediary function. Yeah. What they're doing is providing access to the computer network that connects that machine to other institutions. The other institution could be a brokerage house. It could be a bank. It could be a credit union. And so you're requiring these uh, banks, otherwise authorized to do business across the board, no matter where you look, to provide a free service to people with whom they do no business. Is that we what are it boils down to? Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. We, we do not do that. The ordinances simply uh, require the banks uh, to charge once for that particular transaction and not twice. Um, I, the I'm banks not, afraid I don't quite understand that. Charge once and not twice? Yes. The, the banks actually impose the charge in two different ways for the same transaction. They impose what's called an interchange fee, which is a negotiated fee that is charged automatically to the institution uh, that holds the account that's accessed. And that institution passes it along to the consumer. In How the, does that inter institution pass it along to the consumer? In the ATM transaction itself? Uh, well, it, it could be. It's, it's contemporaneous. It's simultaneous. It's the foreign fee. Um, there are three fees that, that change hands in this transaction. They do it simultaneously by computer. There's the interchange fee, which is charged from the ATM itself to the institution, be it a bank, be it a brokerage house that, that holds the account, that institution simultaneously charges what's called the foreign fee uh, against the account holder. That's the person who puts the card in the machine. At the same time, that person is being charged um, the surcharge, which is the subject of the ordinance. So the 
bank that was responsible for the ATM isn't charging twice. What you're talking about is the bank from which this money comes or the institution from which this money comes makes a charge against the account holder in the bank? Uh, well, that happens, but yes, the bank that owns the ATM does charge twice. The bank that owns the ATM, um, Wells Fargo, for example, will charge once automatically to the institution that holds the account. And that what is the, the paper? What, what does the piece of paper look like? The receipt that flies out of the ATM. I go up. I walk up to an ATM. Um, I don't have anything to do with that bank, but I want to access another financial institution. I put in my card. I put in my PIN number, and it says, "How much money do you want?" And I say, forty dollars." Okay. How much money comes out of the machine? Forty dollars. Forty dollars. Now, how does this dollar uh, fifty get tacked on then? That's charged twice to your account. Backwards, so it doesn't. That charge, that that charge. I'm sorry. So that dollar fifty goes against the account where in the in the institution that's involved ultimately. Both of the charges do. Uh, when you when you receive the forty dollars from the machine, the bank is charging twice. It is charging your account directly. It is also charging your bank directly, which passes on that extra charge to you through the foreign fee. So there are, there are two ch simultaneous charges against your account. And they, so if the fee is a dollar and a fifty, they're paying three dollars? Uh, it could be three dollars, it could be some larger amount. But whatever they're paying. They're paying an additional amount. In, 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 so I, I think it's... You're, you're <coughs> objecting to double fee. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. The second piece of that fee. Do you think that there should be one fee, and who should pay it? There is one fee. It's charged against the same person who would pay the double fee. Right. Uh, it's that comes out of his account, wherever it is. It comes out of the same pocket. Both fees would come out of the same pocket. And what's the legislative authority that you rely on for the ability to pass an ordinance like this? The best legislative. There's there are a number of expressions of congressional intent over a over a couple decades. I think the clearest and best is in 1994 when Congress amended the National Bank Act and added Section 43. There was a conference committee report uh, that went along with those amendments where Congress said two things. First, it explicitly rejected the uh, preemption position that is what the OCCs and banks bring to the court today. And it went further than that and asked the OCC to withdraw its regulation that contained that preemption position. So you're talking about just preemption in, in the abstract? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm talking about preemption of state and local fee ordinances. Uh, the OCC's previous regulation had stated um, basically what the OCC's position in this case is. It had stated that because national banks have the authority to impose non-interest charges, um, state laws that purport to limit or prohibit any of those charges are preempted under the authority of the National Bank Act. You lost this case in the district court. We did. And what was the district court's reasoning? It was essentially a field preemption type <coughs> reasoning. The district court reasoned that because banks, uh, national banks or federal savings and loans have the authority to impose a fee, um, and because that authority rests in the National Bank Act or the Homeowners Loan Act, therefore state and local governments simply don't have the ability to limit or prohibit those fees. Federal says it's okay, states and local therefore can't do it. What's the, ro what's the problem with that argument? Well, the problem is that Congress explicitly rejected that argument um, most clearly in 1994 when it, when it told the OCC that that was an, a, an aggressive, excessive preemption position and asked the OCC to withdraw the regulation that, that put that uh, preemption position forward. And indeed, the OCC did. And uh, at the same time, Congress cited the California Supreme Court's uh, opinion in Purdue versus Crocker National Bank as a valid expression of Congress's intent. That Is there anything affirmative in federal law that says states, local governments, and municipalities are empowered to do what you're doing? Is there anything affirmatively that gives you that power? Well, yes, there is. Uh, if you're asking if there, whether there is language in a statute. That, that's exactly yes. what I'm asking. There, there is the language in the, in the Electronic Funds Transfer Act that, um, that expresses an intent that state and local governments um, may, may regulate in a more prohibitive fashion than the, than the minimal national standards. Could you, what's the language? Read it for me. It's the savings clause in, in 1396Q. Mm. What does it say? 
it says that this subchapter does not annul, alter, or affect the laws of any state relating to electronic fund transfers, except to the extent that those laws are inconsistent with the provisions of the subchapter. Well, and how then, does, it, how does that trickle down to the municipalities? Do, do they have the authority to regulate uh, other regulated utilities like railroads and telephone companies and uh, power I think companies? There are, in different areas, there are different preemption analyses. Some of them, it might be a field preemption analysis. Certainly, uh, when uh, the Supreme Court held in U United States versus Locke, for example, <coughs> that the regulation of tankers on the high seas was an area of, of federal concern that, that preempted that field, there's field preemption. Well, you Another, get into the occupation of the field issue, don't you? Has the federal government occupied the field of international bank uh, <coughs> inter internet uh, transactions? It certainly has not. It has not. And I, I don't think that's a disputed fact. I think the parties agree that this is a conflict, implied conflict preemption case. I think where the parties disagree is on the effect to give to all the evidence of congressional intent that states retain the authority to regulate in the area of fees and in the area of ATM transactions. Um, well, states are one thing. I, I was wondering about uh, can a municipality by just pull up its own bootstraps and say we're going to declare these ATMs to be a public utility and we're going to regulate them? Well, I think that, that generally, at least in, in this court, has applied the same preemption principles in, in, to states as it has to, to uh, local governments. Uh, well, I think that any power the states have trickles down to the municipalities. They can regulate uh, life insurance companies but that are, there are regulated by the states. No, there are certainly separate preemption uh, principles that apply vis-a-vis -vis the state government and the local government. There are preemption principles, uh, for example, in California, st state and local governments share a police power, and there are certainly conflict preemption principles between what state governments and what local governments may do uh, as among and between themselves. Uh, certainly, there could be a case where federal law delineated a separate power for a state government that was uh, distinct in some way from a power delegated to a local government. Um, that's not the case here. What else does the city of Santa Monica and the city of San Francisco do to regulate the operation of banks and financial institutions? Uh, in a general way, I can't answer that. I'm sure there are safety regulations that relate to, uh, that relate to ATM terminals, but in a, in a comprehensive way, I couldn't answer that question, and certainly not, not with regard to Santa Monica. So I think what Judge Goodwin is getting at is all of a sudden you're allowing small municipalities to take over the, the function that the state usually uh, exercises in occupying the fields for the, for the purpose of uniformity, among other things. You could have the city of Lakeview doing one thing, the city of XYZ doing completely other things. You, you certainly, you, you do, Your Honor. And I think Congress considered that issue of uniformity. And, and the most notable expression of congressional intent on that topic is the quote that this court uh, cited from the Valley Bank case, where Congress uh, explicitly re considered uniform electronic funds transfer laws and then rejected it and allowed uh, um, experimentation at the, at the state and local level. What, what is the basis for this court to get into the regulation of these fees? Well, it is a basic uh, preemption principle. I mean, the burden as, as the banks recognize, and as, as, as we have argued, in a case of conflict preemption, the burden is really on the banks uh, to show that um, federal law or that Congress intended preemption in this area. I think in Barnett Bank, for example, the court sets forth two uh, parts of its preemption standard, its conflict preemption standard. First, the Supreme Court says the state law may regulate national banks uh, as long as it does not significantly interfere with the national bank power. Then the court went on to say, of course, we will give effect to congressional intent. Uh, Franklin, the court, did the same thing. Um, the court said, we will, not, uh, we will allow a state law to the extent it does not impair or annul some national bank power, but we will give effect to congressional intent. Do we have any real congressional intent in this case? Yes. Yes. Yes, you do. You have... 
to the extent that this court has always relied on conference committee reports as official expressions of congressional intent. What does that say as you read it? Uh, it says, if I can quote, this is the 1994 conference court, uh, report, just to pick a single one. States have a strong interest in the activities and operations of depository institutions doing business within their jurisdictions, regardless of the type of charter the institution holds. In particular, states have a legitimate interest in protecting the rights of their consumers. Um, just a couple paragraphs later is where the court, the, where Congress specifically looks at the issue of fees and state regulations of fees and specifically rejects the OCC preemption position that is well, this is the basis for the bank's argument and the OCC's position in this case. Congress... That is, there is no federal preemption. There is no federal preemption by virtue of the authority to provide a particular banking service. That uh, there has to be something more. It's what the Supreme Court said in Franklin and Barnett. In Barnett, for example, even though the court found that there was absolutely no indication of congressional intent, um, that the state be allowed to regulate the sale of insurance in that state. Um, the court still applied uh, a conflict preemption test saying states have the right to regulate unless there is significant interference. What do we learn from De La Cuesta? I'm sorry, I, I just realized I... What do we learn from De La Cuesta? We learn that is a conflict, a conflict preemption analysis applies to HOLA as well, and that congressional intent is the basis for preemption with respect to the Homeowners Loan Act as well. And I'm sorry, I, I'm happy Why to Why doesn't De La Cuesta cut against you? Stop, stop looking at the lights and just answer our questions. <laughs> okay. You'll be okay. Well, I don't think it does cut against us. I think uh, certainly it found preemption in that case, but as... On the basis of what? On the basis of conflict preemption. That there was, uh, a, there was a clear federal <clears throat> purpose to allow something to occur, even though it was an option, the state didn't allow it to occur, so therefore there's a conflict and it's preempted. Why isn't that very similar to this? Apparently, federal law allows the charging of these kinds of fees, and your ordinance prohibits. So there's a conflict between the two. You're trying to stop something that federal law allows, and it seems that De La Cuesta says that's a class, this is a classic case for preemption. Well, there are two parts to the analysis. First of all, the courts do not hold it simply because um, federal law grants a permission uh, and state law regulates that permission, that there is a conflict. Uh, there has to be some type of significant interference, for example. The standard goes further than simply saying there is a conflict. Second significant of all, interference? You're prohibiting what federal law allows. That in itself is not a significant interference. It's not? Uh, it is not. No, because... Uh, the field was vacant, as you can see. I'm sorry? The field was vacant. You come in and occupy it. That's your, that's your approach. Well, the field is not vacant, certainly. I mean, there is some federal regulation in the area, but there is also... as to this item of fees? Well, there is a specific congressional expression of intent that states be allowed to, to move into that field and to regulate. Uh, and I think that's what distinguishes this case from Franklin, from Barnett Bank, from De La Cuesta, where you have direct regulation in a direct banking uh, of a direct banking function. Here you have, and you have no affirmative expression of intent by Congress to the contrary. Here you have the strongest multiple and consistent expressions of congressional intent that, um, that states be allowed to regulate in the area. Well, De La Cuesta says the conflict does not evaporate because the board's regulation simply permits but does not compel federal savings and loans to include due on sale clauses in their contracts and to enforce, et cetera. The board consciously has chosen not to mandate it desires to afford associations the flexibility. California courts have forbidden a federal savings and loan to enforce a due-on-sale clause solely at his option and have deprived the lender of the flexibility given by the board. Why isn't that very similar to what we have here? I think because there the court is recognizing a congressional intent that is exactly opposite to the congressional intent in this case. In De La Cuesta, and that well, is what intent makes it with respect to what? There seems in, to be a federal intent that would allow the charging of these fees. An intent to allow uh, flexibility of approaches uh, yeah, without to, state regulation in the to area. Allow the charging of these fees, right? Uh, to allow in that area a flexibility, in that particular area of mortgage, 
of mortgage-related uh, due-on-sale clauses a flexibility of approaches in the area that is not subject to state or local limitation. Here, the core issue is the state or local limitation. And, and I'm, at this point, I feel I must defer to my colleague from Santa Monica. All right, we're not going to, we'll let him have his, say his piece. Okay. In that don't, case. Don't worry, you haven't stepped all over his time. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Adam Radinsky, and I represent the city of Santa Monica. And due to the number of issues and the shortness of time, I'd like to address some of the matters that Your Honors are concerned about. Um, just the, the initial matter that uh, Judge Trott raised about what is this uh, fee and uh, to explain the, the double fee, I think one, one additional point to mention that's very important on the facts here is that the interchange fee, which is how the banks are already getting paid for this transaction, is a negotiated fee between the banks and the ATM networks that's been going on for as long as there have been ATMs. The intent of that fee has always been to compensate the banks fully for this exact transaction. So this isn't just some fee that these cities how picked that, out. How does that fee work? The way the interchange fee works, uh, Your Honor. Yeah, the way it works when, when an outside customer comes to a bank's ATM, uh, the customer's bank electronically pays the ATM bank the interchange fee. So the ATM owning bank is compensated for the transaction through that fee. That's always been how it's done. That's always been the intent of that fee. Um, now, you, there was a discussion about um, what legislative authority, what congressional intent do we have to allow this. And uh, an important point is that, of course, it's their burden of proof to show a conflict with federal law. But there is ample authority uh, in both the area of national bank fees and ATMs, both. In the National Bank Act, we have the regulation 7.4002, which the OCC was forced to adopt and reject its earlier regulation, which explicitly uh, uh, allows for state regulation of these fees. Uh, and there is a, a preemption clause at the end which says on a case-by-case -case basis, the OCC will look at whether there's preemption under the supremacy clause. That provision would make no sense uh, under the bank's interpretation, which is that every fee that they are able to charge is automatically immune from regulation. Uh, so that's, that's one expression of both the congressional intent, because Congress forced the OCC to change its regulation, and intent as expressed through the regulation. Uh, the other statute is the Electronic Funds Transfer Act, uh, which, in which the congressional intent is very clear, as this court recognized in Valley Bank, and, and, and as is cited in the briefs, uh, Congress intended states and cities to regulate ATMs in the consumer interest. In fact, the EFTA has a specific definition of the word state to include municipalities. And the congressional intent in that law is uh, very well documented in the case law and, and in the briefs that Congress intended uh, the federal law to be just a, a, a bare bones baseline of protections and that states and cities were to go out uh, this is a new area. In the 1970s, ATMs were brand new, and Congress intended to allow this uh, type of regulation by states and cities. This is exactly what Congress intended. Uh, so the authority is on both sides in this case. The national bank fees, Congress, uh, and by the way, uh, the, the report council uh, re referred to, Congress is specifically chastising the federal banking regulators for being overly zealous in claiming that everything's preempted at the expense of consumers. And so what you have is explicit congressional intent to allow state regulation of unfair bank, national bank fees, and requiring the OCC to do an annual accounting of its preemption opinions and to, make, to do formal notice and comment rulemaking every time they claim uh, preemption. Uh, so as far as the, the rule of law to be applied in this case, that is derived from the Barnett Bank case. That's the closest Supreme Court case to to come up with some kind of test for, for whether we have National Bank Act preemption. And what Barnett Bank says is that the states have the power to regulate national banks, and they lose that power only when they uh, severely impair a national banking power. In the Barnett Bank case, that was easy. There was an explicit grant of power saying the banks can sell insurance. In the De La Cuesta case that Judge Trott referred to, there's an explicit granting of power for the savings and loans, saying uh, that 
you have exclusive authority over the due on sale clause in, in, in your loan contracts. In this case, far from any explicit provision of the law, there is nothing in the law that the banks can point to to suggest that they have the authority to charge this fee. Judge Trout was asking about uh, uh, um, whether this fee was uh, uh, somehow mentioned in the federal law. It's not. The banks can't point to any provision of the National Bank Act or the regulations or legislative history or anything to suggest that this uh, surcharge fee, the fee on top of the interchange fee, is in any way countenanced by federal law. And it's their burden of proof to show some conflict with the federal law. Um, as far as uh, so, and 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 just to address the issue of um, how that test would be applied in this case, because the, the Barnett Bank case sets down the standard that states are preempted only when they severely impair a national banking power. What's the national banking power in this case, according to the banks? Their their argument is that. They have the power to charge this surcharge um, simply because they're able to do it. And basically, if you read their brief carefully, and the OCC's brief even more obviously says that anything the banks can do is automatically immune. Now, that would turn Supreme Court precedent on its ear. It goes contrary to congressional intent. What things can they do in relation to these, uh, the problem we've got at hand? I'm sorry, what can the banks do, Your Honor? banking authority given by federal law that in any way relates to the problem we're arguing about. The only authority federal law gives them is the authority to charge fees in general under 7.4002. The OCC had to withdraw its field preemption opinion, which was wrong. Uh, and those fees uh, have to be reasonable, which is section B of the regulation, those safe and sound and reasonable fees. The cities don't dispute any of that in this case. That, that the banks have the ability to charge the fee generally and that this fee, um, according to them, is safe and sound. But all of that begs the real question in this case, which is, can the banks charge that fee in the face of contrary consumer protection laws? And the analysis for that question uh, is, is done under the Supremacy Clause. So what does consumer protection laws mean? I mean, there's full notice to everybody that you're going to be charged this extra fee when you walk up to the ATM. So consumer protection doesn't seem to cover this. It's a kind of different kind of consumer protection. We're not going to let anybody charge you for this. Right. Well, Your Honor, uh, that's different kind <clears throat> of consumer protection. I'll address the factual part first, Your Honor. I mean, parties may differ as to what uh, they individually consider to be the best protection of consumers or to be consumer protection. The fact of the matter is that the legislative findings of both ordinances and the stated purpose of both ordinances and the effect of both ordinances is to prohibit what is inherently an excessive and double fee. We're not just talking about, oh, this one goes a little bit too high. We don't think that's fair. This is a fee which, by its nature, is uniquely duplicative uh, and unfair. Uh, so yes, well, Your Honor is absolutely right. Re expensive restaurants are charged more money for food than inexpensive restaurants. What's the constitutional prohibition of charging what you want? Well, Your Honor, there, there, there's no argument by the cities that there's any constitutional prohibition, but. But Congress and the OCC specifically anticipate state regulation of some national bank fees. So the argument could be made with respect to any fee, any fee as to a checking account or anything else that if you don't like it, go elsewhere. And one of the things that is unique about the surcharge is that it's the only fee that is not subject to those same free market forces, where if you don't like the fee, take your account somewhere else where you don't have to pay for the extra checking fee or something. The surcharge is the one fee where, in cities like Santa Monica and San Francisco, where the evidence shows there's a striking uh, market dominance by these two banks, the, the remedy, uh, if most of the ATMs are owned by these two banks, is you join them. So it's, it's the one fee that we're aware of in, in the, our economy we have, where... We have new banks popping up in Idaho all the time, and they come in and they say, you know, all those fees those other people are charging you? Not here. And they, they attract a lot of business. Right, understood. And, and Your Honor, it, it, is, it is definitely an interesting policy area. I would point out also that for purposes of federal preemption, the uh, policy behind the ordinances is not relevant to the analysis unless there is some actual infringement with a, a national banking power. Do you have anything else you'd like to tell us, Counsel? Uh, no, Your Honor. I would just like to reserve a few minutes for a bottle, if that's okay. okay. Thank you. How is the other side going to proceed?
Uh, Your Honor, my name is Edward Bruce, and I'm speaking for all the banks. And uh, Mr. Roger and I had agreed that I would get 14 minutes to talk about the banks and national bank preemption and the uh, EFTA, and he would spend six minutes on the OTS scheme and, and um, the thrifts. Before I you get into your prepared remarks, could you could I ask you whether the uh, you agree with the uh, appellants on the uh, double fee uh, breakdown? I'm not sure I follow exactly what these two fees are. No, absolutely not. In fact, it's uh, they they rely so heavily upon the Valley Bank case. You would have thought they would have thought through a little bit more the answer they gave to you. What happens is this. There is an interchange fee uh, whenever you go to an ATM, and that's worked out en masse. It's not individually negotiated. No single bank who owns ATM sets it. You buy into it when you buy into the network. And the home bank, the depositor's bank, gets a certain amount of the fee, even though it's so-called foreign fee, off-us fee, because you went to somebody else's bank ATM. Uh, and then they give a little bit of it to the ATM-owning bank. Now, that's been going on for years and years and years. The Valley Bank case upheld Nevada's efforts to say, no, we want, we want banks to be able to charge ATM fees at, that, at the unit. Now, that's what that case held. It's important to understand the objectives that banks must uh, consider when they set their fees. They must consider not only costs and profit, but they also must consider impact, competitive impact, uh, deterrent of customer misuse. Here, and the record is absolutely clear on this, there are about as many ATMs owned in San Francisco and Santa Monica by American Express, E-Trade, companies like that, that are totally outside their ordinance. They can charge whatever they want, and they have a strong competitive advantage by virtue of getting those ATM fees, such as we're charging too, when they go to places like airports and shopping malls and the like and have to pay part of that to the landlord. And that couldn't possibly be realized through the interchange fee. Uh, let me uh, agree with some of the things that uh, counsel for the other side said. Barnett Bank does control this case, but unfortunately he didn't tell you what Barnett Bank holds. And this is the Supreme Court's most recent and unanimous opinion written by Justice Breyer. Two important principles here. First, the enumerated, that is specific, and incidental powers of national banks ordinarily preempt contrary state law, ordinarily preempt. That wipes out any anti-preemption presumption. The Locke case in the Supreme Court fortifies that. Secondly, the test is whether or not state or local law prevents or significantly interferes with a national bank's exercise of its powers. Now, Barnett relied principally upon Franklin National Bank, where we firmly ground our case. That was a 1950-something decision of the Supreme Court. There, the court held this. We do not believe that the incidental, those are not the express powers, the incidental powers granted to national banks should be construed so narrowly to preclude the use of advertising a bank's authorized service. Franklin applies a fortiori here for three reasons. There's not a mention anywhere in the Bank Act, anywhere in the regulations about a bank's authority to advertise. On the other hand, the regulations are absolutely clear, and Judge Trott, I think your De La Cuesta questions were bringing this out, that banks have express authority under OCC regulations to charge fees for their authorized services. That's one point that makes this a fortiori. Another point is this. In, in uh, Barnett, the court observed about Franklin that there the act contained no indication that Congress intended to subject national bank powers to local restriction. That's at page... Um, 34, the Barnett opinion, here there is nothing in the National Bank Act that in any ways gives any authority to local governments or state governments to regulate fees. Not in the National Bank Act? Not in the National Bank Act, nor, and I'll get to the EFTA, nothing there either. More importantly, if I may, nothing I'm sorry. Here, nothing here, nothing here. Well, get more, to the EFTA. That's. Uh, I, I'd like to mention one thing about the National Bank Act, and then I will. 
in 19, they, they, talk, they talk about the Regal Neal amendments in 1994, and they talk about what Congress found and what Congress decided. Well, what Congress finds and what Congress decided is found in the language of statutes, not in committee reports. And in 1996, Congress specifically amended Section 36 of the National Bank Act, which does give states power over branches in many respects, specifically amended it to take out ATMs to make it clear that ATMs were not within the power of states. There again, a fortiori. Now, to the EFTA. We have amici in this case, and one of them is the state of California, and it was providing a very valuable amicus function, going beyond what the parties uh, on either side say, by saying this about the EFTA. This is page 24 of the California brief. The district court was correct in noting that the EFTA does not explicitly authorize local ordinances like the ones at issue here, and that the savings provision by its terms applies only to the EFTA, i.e., not to the National Bank Act. So if it's preempted by something else, the EFTA never goes there with it. It has the nothing to do with it. And that's exactly what the Eighth Circuit held in Bank One. That's in 190 Fed Third at page 850. It's discussed at length in our brief, held squarely and precisely, and this court would be in conflict with that circuit, but it held to the contrary, that the EFTA has nothing to do with relieving uh, states of any restrictions by virtue of National Bank Act preemption. That case dealt with a state's attempt to regulate advertising, uh, just like Franklin rejected it to regulate the location of ATMs. It rejected it. It rejected these arguments based upon EFTA. Um, I, I, could, I could go on and talk a long time about this case because I've been involved in it for a long time. I have said to you most of what I, most of what I want to. Uh, well, then why don't you cede the floor to your uh, colleague if you have nothing else to well, say? Well, with, with, I'll, I'll, close, I'll close. Well, I'm inviting the court. If you have questions about the National Bank Act, how it works, I think, I hope, I have laid it out pretty clearly, so I'd like to be able to answer your those. Your position is the city's got no power prevent the banks from my 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 my, posi my position my position using the uh, machinery that they've got my position is that when a bank has the right to provide a service under the National Bank Act and clearly as your opinion in M&M &M leasing some years ago judge Steed makes clear about this uh, we couldn't even let these people come to our machines and use them the way we do to make their withdrawals unless it's part of the business of banking because you can only do what's part of the business of banking when you have an authorized the right to provide a service like that as we clearly do then you also have the incidental power this is what franklin was all about the incidental power to advertise that and if you have the power to advertise it surely you have the power to charge for it barnett bank says very clearly it's the enumerated and incidental powers that preempt, and when a state prevents, not just significantly interferes, but prevents the exercise of that power, then uh, their acts are preempted. A fortiori. Well, a, a fortiori, and uh, this business about the well, regal... Let me ask you this. Yes, sir. I admit I'm not as up-to-date on banking law should be perhaps but the, as you see it there's nothing anywhere that permits a city to impose any kind of tax or there's nothing there's nothing in in the in the EFTA it, it, its policies are drastically different they're consumer protection policies they're express best in the 1999 amendments to that statute, which again addressed ATM fees, just like the 1996 amendments to the National Bank Act addressed ATMs. And what Congress did when it acted through positive law, through statute, was to say, you've got to give notice before you charge the fee. That's what Congress said in 1999 when it addressed the issue. That 
presumes, as the district court in this case recognized, that you got a right to charge the fee, otherwise you wouldn't even have to give notice. And the consumer protection, Judge Trott, you have it exactly right, I think, in terms of your conception of uh, consumer protection as to what it normally means and what's going on here. The banks, uh, the, the cities did not really tell you what is on the face of their ordinances. The purpose of these ordinances is to restructure competition in the banking industry. They're aimed at two banks, my two clients. Together they have more ATMs in California than anybody else. And they're upset that people go to those ATMs, use them, and are recruited to be depositors there. And what they want to set up is something for, that helps smaller, largely state banks, I would assume. That is miles and miles and miles removed from the Environmental Funds Transfer Act, which is an ordinary garden variety consumer protection act. And I, unless the court has more questions, I will cede the rest of my time. Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, my name is Kent Roger, representing Appelli California Federal Bank. I feel a little bit, I suppose, like the poor relation, um, given uh, what's uh, transpired in the argument. Um, I, I don't know whether the cities have forgotten about the fact that uh, the court entered a judgment in favor of uh, a federal savings bank uh, with a completely independent and separate statutory uh, and regulatory scheme, uh, or uh, whether they are conceding that the court's uh, judgment was correct. Um, in, in any event, if I could uh, maybe take just a few moments to recap uh, the first principles of the federal regulatory scheme as respects federal savings banks and how the De La Cuesta decision really is dispositive of uh, the, uh, the issues here. Uh, simply put, where Congress in a statute has directed an agency to exercise its discretion in the form of a regulation, and pursuant to that express statutory authority, that rulemaking authority, the agency promulgates regulations intended to preempt state law, the court's inquiry is limited to a determination whether the agency exceeded that statutory authority or acted arbitrarily. That's one of the cornerstone principles of De La Cuesta. Here, the Homeowners Loan Act, the HOLA, uh, the statute which governs federal savings banks, a financial institution specifically uh, defined uh, in the ordinances, mandates that the Office of Thrift Supervision, the regulator, shall provide for the sound operation and regulation of federal savings banks, issuing such regulations as the OTS determines to be appropriate. Pursuant to that authority, the OTS has promulgated regulations as to federal savings bank operations, generally and specifically with respect to deposit and credit-related activities. In each of these regulations, the OTS has expressly and unambiguously stated that it intends to occupy the field which is the subject of the regulation with respect to operations, with respect to deposit-related activities, and with respect to credit-related activities. Under De La Cuesta, the OTS's statement of its intent to occupy those fields is unambiguous and therefore it's enforceable unless it's outside the scope of its delegated authority. But the cities have never challenged the appropriateness of any of the OTS's regulations themselves. All of them were enacted after statutory notice and comment pursuant to the statute's direction to the OTS to promulgate them and therefore they are well within the statutory prerogative granted by the statute to the OTS. Again, in De La Cuesta, in a remarkably similar context, the Supreme Court found that the bank board, the OTS's predecessor, had the authority to issue the regulations preempting state law, those relating to due on sale. And likewise, this court in the Stein case held that the regulatory control of the bank board over federal savings and loan associations is so pervasive as to leave no room for state regulatory control. The court does not substitute its own judgment with respect to the wisdom of the regulation. The court determines only whether or not the regulation was authorized by the statute. The judicial authorities that we cited in our briefs provide ample basis for the OTS's own view, as stated in the regulations themselves, that the statute gives the authority to announce field preemption. And even if this court were to conclude that the statute was ambiguous, it should give the effect 
uh, it should give effect to the OTS's regulation, uh, in other words, Chevron deference, and similarly under our, uh, it should give effect to an agency's interpretation of its own ambiguous regulation should the court find that the, uh, the regulation was ambiguous. Again, not the case here. That De La Cuesta did not reach the field preemption question but chose to rely solely on conflict preemption doesn't, understand, doesn't undermine the analysis in this case. Since the due on sale regulation in De La Cuesta didn't purport to occupy a field, the court relied simply on the glaring conflict between state law and the bank board regulation to uphold preemption. The city's two answers to these arguments both fail. They say that since the regulation in 555, which deals with ATMs, deals specifically with ATMs, that it controls. And they note that that particular regulation does not announce field preemption. But having invoked 555, the cities must apply it. And if they do, they'll see that 555 is a regulation that merely allows federal savings banks to use ATM as a means to provide an otherwise authorized activity. Where do you look to find the authorization for the activity that the ATMs are a means to provide? You look to 557 and 560, as, as we've cited in our briefs and as the OTS has in its as well. Those two regulations announce the field occupation. By doing the three-part preemption itself, the OTS has come to a conclusion that in cases relating to deposits and in cases relating to loans, they will occupy the field. Whether or not the regulation has to do with ATMs, tellers, or otherwise. The city's final argument is that, well, uh, those particular regulations don't apply here because they relate only to deposits or loans of the FSB. They don't relate to a foreign transaction, as is the subject of the, of the ordinances. Um, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. This is why. 555, again, merely allows use of ATMs as a means to achieve an otherwise authorized end. If the activity isn't authorized, then the bank's problem is not whether it can charge a fee. Uh, it's whether or not it can engage in the activity at all, in other, way, in other words, allowing foreign users uh, to use the ATMs. Where does one look whether or not that authority is, is, uh, is allowed by the OTS? Again, in 557 and 560. Once that authority is allowed, then the field preemption exists. Finally, uh, Your Honors, uh, we have conflict preemption in addition to field preemption. Uh, Again, and finally, uh, DLC, uh, Dela Quest is on point. In the regulations, the OTS has listed particular state laws which will be preempted, those relating to service charges and fees, loan-related fees, terms of credit, and disbursements. And as in Dela Cuesta, by definition, the contrary ordinances which ban uh, what the regulations particularly allow uh, are in conflict and must fall. Uh, Judge Walker's uh, decision granting summary judgment was appropriate and proper. Uh, we urge you to affirm it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roger. We'll give each one of you a minute. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll, I'll, uh, the, uh, Your Honors have been asking about where is the authority in federal law for the states or cities to do this. And we have to take a close look at Regulation 7.4002, especially subsection D, because that is the clearest expression. Uh, in fact, it's the, the codification of the congressional intent as uh, the OCC was compelled to admit that, and the, the text of that states in part, it's evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis uh, whether uh, a, a bank may charge a fee in the face of a contrary state law that, pur that purports to limit or prohibit the national bank fee. And that comes as no surprise because there is a history of cases, both state and federal, about the states regulating national bank fees. This is nothing new. Uh, if anything, the bank's theory in this case, which is that anything they're able to do automatically is immune and preempts any regulation, that's the radical departure from the case law and the congressional intent. The fact is they're able to do many things, and they're regulated by the states every day. Was we the Eighth Circuit wrong in Bank One? Uh, Your Honor, 
No, Bank One is very similar to Franklin. In Bank One, we have two areas, and actually the bank in that case chose not to appeal on the, uh, the fee issue, which the district court held in favor of the state. But in that case, we have two areas where Congress has spoken on behalf of national banks, saying that uh, ge geographical restrictions and advertising, there's a clear tie to express congressional intent. And in the Franklin case, which he talked about, there's a direct tie to an express federal power, which is receiving deposits. In this case, they don't even attempt to argue how this tangential fee, which is on non-account holders, on top of the fee they already receive, how that is somehow tied to their core national banking powers. That's why they're forced into this extreme position of saying, just because we can do it means it's immune. If that's true, then there is no room whatsoever for the states to regulate national banks. That's contrary to over 100 years of Supreme Court precedent. Uh, just a couple other. Please sum up. I'm sorry, yes. Um, just one final point, which is that uh, in addition to, if, if we accept their, their logic here, uh, it turns the tradition of state regulation uh, on its head and it ignores congressional intent. Every federal preemption case turns on congressional intent. In this case, what's striking is that all the evidence of that intent is on the side of allowing the regulation. And finally, I would just point out that there are no findings of fact in the district court. The district court actually refused discovery in this case and uh, deemed this solely an issue of law, which preemption often is. However, under the Barnett Bank standard, the banks bear the burden of proof to show a, an impairment of their uh, banking powers. And all they rely on in this case for that power is this surcharge, which is nowhere mentioned in the federal law and which the states and cities have the power to regulate. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, everybody. The case just argued is, you have something you'd like to say? No. All right. Case just argued is ordered submitted and we'll be in recess until tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Next week on America and the Courts, a question and answer session with Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and high school students from New York and Virginia. Join us on America and the Courts Saturday evening at 7 Eastern and at 4 p.m. for viewers on the West Coast. Tomorrow in Washington Journal, two reporters will discuss President Bush's upcoming State of the Union address next week and his budget proposals. Timothy Berger, congressional correspondent for the New York Daily News, and Mike Allen, White House correspondent for the Washington Post. And then the Filipino